Uh, so, hello, my name is Alan Jude. I've been a uh, previous developer for 16, or well, a previous user for 16 years, mostly as a sysadmin, and then over the course of the last couple of years, got sucked into docs when I wrote some help for ZFS in the handbook, and then became a doc committer, and then became a source committer, and then got elected to core, and all that fun stuff. <laughs> Uh, and co-authored the FreeBSD Mastery ZFS and Advanced ZFS books with uh, Michael W. Lucas. Uh, and for my day job, I'm the architect of the Scale Engine Video Streaming CDN, which is streaming the conference right now for all the people at home. Uh, and every week, with uh, Benedict over there, <laughs> I host BSDNow.tv, a weekly podcast where we cover the news of what's happening in the world of BSD and try to interview developers and other interesting people who are doing stuff uh, in BSD or with BSD. Uh, so, you know, feel free to volunteer yourself to be a victim of that uh, at any point. Uh, and with our video streaming company, we use quite a bit of ZFS. Uh, we have about a petabyte of storage spread across uh, 32 locations now in 11 different countries. Uh, some of it is, uh, about half of it is uh, in my basement. <laughs> and the rest is spread across the world. Um, <coughs> so, <laughs> uh, what I'm going to talk about today is Z-Standard, which is a new compression algorithm uh, designed by Jan Collette, uh, who's the original designer of LZ4, which is uh, the compression algorithm that's been in the default in ZFS, uh, I don't know, since V5000-ish? Something like that. Um, the reason it's the default in ZFS is uh, it's very high speed, so uh, even on uncompressible data, it doesn't tie down the system for a long time trying to compress it, so it makes it safe to just turn it on for everything. Um, whereas new Z standard is designed to uh, have compression levels that are higher than LZ4 and more on par with what you get from like GZIP, um, but to do that a lot faster uh, by just you know, being 25 years newer. Uh, so it uses a combination of different uh, compression techniques, including a finite entry coder, a Huffman coder like you see in most other compression, and so on, um, and uh, give you more control than you have with GZIP. Right? If you think of uh, GZIP, which is available in uh, ZFS, it has levels 1 through 9, 1 being the uh, fastest and 9 being the slowest and providing more compression. Uh, Z-Standard has 22 levels currently. Uh, well, it had 22 levels until they added infinite negative, negative levels uh, a couple of months ago. So in addition to having levels 1 through 19, which provide higher and higher compression at slower and slower speeds, which I'll talk about in a minute, and they have uh, 20 through 22, which are their ultra mode, which I didn't put into ZFS because the memory requirements are... Uh, they don't make sense for this, the size of the blocks that we're working with in ZFS. Uh, I haven't yet implemented the negative levels of compression, uh, but I'm going to talk about why those would be interesting and how we might implement those in ZFS as well. So basically, when they set out the 22 levels, they made the obvious mistake of not leaving some room on the low end. Uh, instead of, you know, they can always add a level 23, but you know, they've already defined what level 1 is, so they can't make something even faster than level 1 which it turns out it didn't take him very long to do. Uh, so now you can have negative 1 or negative 10 uh, or negative 100 or negative 100,000, all of which provide a different amount of compression, uh, less and less as you get more and more negative. Uh, the other interesting thing that Z-Standard has is a dictionary training mode. Um, so the, the concept behind this one is, particularly why uh, Facebook was interested in it, is if you have a large series of uh, JSON messages uh, that have the same structure, right? The same set of keys in the JSON. And that's how everything in your browser from Facebook is a series of incoming JSON messages that, oh, this new item was added, this new item was added, whatever. Kind of same thing goes if you're using the web client on Twitter, right? And you see there are four new messages, you click the thing and it loads the JSON of those new messages. And each of those has like the handle, the person, the time, and the message or whatever. Uh, so with a special dictionary training mode in Z-Standard, it can learn about the format of the message, the parts that are the same every time. And by training it with that, you can create a compression that's even faster uh, and even better compression because you know the uh, internal information about the structure of the message. 
uh, and even more bits you can take out. Uh, so the way this will work eventually is that um, in the HTTP headers when you're downloading the JSON, the, an extra header will point you to the dictionary file that you feed in with the compressed data that shows Z Standard how to decompress it even faster. Basically, it'll be the template of the message, and you get to remove all the, the repeated information. Uh, so to give you an idea of what Z Standard looks like uh, compared to other compression algorithms, compared to Zlib, which is what powers gzip, uh, we can see on the, the typical compression benchmark uh, working set called the cilia corpus, uh, that Z Standard gets slightly better compression, 2.87 versus 2.74. Uh, but you can see it actually compresses more than four times faster and decompresses quite a bit faster as well. Although, when you compare it to LZ4, it's not as fast and really, really not as fast for decompression. Uh, but you look, compare the compression ratio and you see there's a, a big enough delta there. And then you remember that those speeds are per core. And you probably have quite a few cores. Uh, you might actually even have more cores than you have disks. Uh, in which case, as long as your disk is going to be the bottleneck, not your CPU, you might as well compress it more because it's actually going to improve your performance because writing less data is faster than writing more data. Yes, all the numbers on here are for one core at four gigahertz on an i7. There's a slightly more detailed version of this one on the Z Standard website. And it might have been updated uh, for an even newer version. Uh, and this is comparing the Dash 1, the fastest version of gzip. Uh, we'll talk about the others in a minute. Uh, so back in August of 2016, Z Standard hit 1.0 and made the release. And there was a big explanation about it and some news coverage and so on. Uh, and I immediately thought, well, that'd be really nice for ZFS especially since that was about the time we were starting to hear uh, about George Wilson working on the compressed arc feature, where the cache in memory in ZFS was going to cache the already compressed version off disk. And you were, you know, any compression you got on disk, you were going to gain that in memory, uh, which is, you know, uh, one of my machines now has 100 gigs of memory for cache and has 180 gigs of data cached in it. It's like I've cached more data than I have RAM. Uh, well, if I have a higher compression ratio from a better compression algorithm, the amount of free RAM I get goes up. <laughs> or the, my cache hit ratio goes up. Uh, so I immediately started looking at it. Uh, but the first problem with version 1.0 was Z Standard used a bunch of huge stack variables. And once I reworked it into the FreeBSD kernel, uh, I got really, really strange crashes caused by the stack being overflowed. Uh, and there's no stack protector for the kernel, and so you just, the crash was never the same twice. It was quite interesting. Uh, once I figured out that's what the problem was, I recompiled my kernel and changed the, the number of pages for stacks from 4 to 12 so there'd be enough room. Uh, and, oh, hey, it works. Okay, so, you know, it wasn't such a bad idea. It's just that's probably not going to work. <laughs> um, in the long run. So I started working on a workaround. In LZ4, there's this concept of heap mode. It's basically an if def, and when it's set, we malloc the memory instead of using the stack. Um, and I tried to apply the same concept to, from LZ4 to Z standard. Uh, the problem there was, you know, in the error cases and so on, when it's like return negative one, it's like, oh, well, I have to free that malloc now. Uh, and doing that four times inside the function just got really messy. Uh, and having it all be if deft, so it only does it in heap mode, because you can't free the stack. That also causes bad things to happen. Um, it very quickly got very ugly uh, and was not going to be something that upstream was really interested in. And it wasn't going to be something that we, a patch we were going to want to carry around either. Uh, so this project was stalled at that point in October of 2016 because it was just too ugly. Uh, and it turned out that that year the ZFS Dev Summit was the Monday after EuroBSDCon. So uh, it was happening while I was flying home from Serbia? Bulgaria? Something like that. Um, and then 
uh, reading the notes from the Dev Summit, uh, one of the other uh, ZFS developers, uh, actually Sasso did, uh, imported LZ4 into ZFS. Uh, he had worked on Z standard at the hackathon, uh, but I didn't really hear much about it after that, and I imagine he ran into very much the same problems as me. Uh, but in December of that year, a new version of Z standard came out, and after some complaining from embedded developers, they had switched to not using giant stack variables all the time. Uh, and then uh, in January of 2017, uh, I was at, went to the FreeBSD Storage Summit uh, and was talking about uh, a couple of different things, including how we were doing at keeping up with OpenZFS, where we were doing quite well, and how it'd be really good if some features of ZFS were, had originated in FreeBSD and went up when we were, you know, not just pulling in features from upstream, but also sending stuff back. Uh, and so I talked a little bit about the idea of Z standard, and it really got me more interested in it again when other people also liked the idea. So I updated my working tree to this newer version of Z standard, uh, resolved the merge conflicts mostly by chucking all that heap mode stuff out <laughs> uh, and getting rid of it, and built the new uh, ZFS kernel module. Uh, and trying that out, uh, but it was crashing with some use after free and other problems. Uh, I was pretty new to C and, and made a kind of a, a rookie mistake with the way I was dealing with a variable. And if you take a struct and add one, it adds a whole stride. So <laughs> it doesn't go up by four bytes, it goes up by more. Anyway. Uh, Z standard is was nice to integrate in this case because it has support for your own malloc interface. Uh, so when you instantiate the API, you say, here is a, a pointers to my malloc, my free, and my uh, cialloc functions. Um, use those uh, instead of your own internal ones for allocating memory, so it's easy to make it use FreeBSD's kernel memory allocator. Um, it also provides uh, an opaque pointer so that you can track information that you need to pass uh, you know, in, in the kernel when you free memory, you also have to tell it how big that memory was, uh, where you don't normally have to deal with that in user land. Uh, however, there were still a few malloc's in some of the supporting code for Z standard. I mean, uh, XX hash and uh, one of the, the finite entropy coder library. Uh, so originally, I did the, the kludgy thing of if depping out those and making it use the, the kernel version of malloc with the extra arguments. Uh, but eventually, uh, I got some help from Warner Losh, and we basically made a set of macros that dealt with it all uh, without having to modify the Z standard files. Um, basically, as part of integrating it into libstand, uh, because Z standard has also been pulled into the kernel proper uh, in FreeBSD, because it's also used for our new compressed kernel crash dump code. Um, and I put it in the loader for uh, booting ZFS that's compressed with Z standard. And in the future, we're hoping to also be able to do um, uh, compressed MFS root images and so on out of Z standard. Uh, so with those changes, it turns out that we didn't actually modify Z standard. Uh, so it's very easy for us to keep, keep up with upstream and as the versions change there. Uh, and I also talked to Jan Colette and uh, they basically cleaned up most of those excess malics and made them use the uh, interface in their API where we provide our own malloc instead. Uh, although Jan also expressed interest in any other APIs or uh, things we can do that would make using Z standard in things like the kernel or ZFS easier. Uh, so if you have a use case for Z standard somewhere else in the operating system, but the current API doesn't, isn't well suited to that, uh, they're definitely interested in coming up with other ways of doing that. Uh, and I have some ideas for that later. So then integrating it into ZFS itself, uh, again, was quite easy. ZFS has a very nice API for uh, providing additional compression functions. Uh, so with those uh, and a little bit of using the uh, opaque pointer when you alloc and free so that we can keep track of uh, where that memory belongs to, uh, it was pretty straightforward to get it working. Uh, and I created a, a code review uh, on Fabricator so that you can look at it and uh, you can try it out, although I'm not, we're not 100% sure that the on-disk format is stable yet, so 
Just know that any pool you create with it might not work with any other version of ZFS ever. <laughs> but right now, there's no known issues. So if, if, if you don't poke too many holes in it, maybe it'll be OK. <laughs> uh, so the way we went about doing it, uh, Z standard was imported into Contrib in FreeBSD uh, because BAP wanted it in user land for compressing log files. And uh, Mark and Conrad put it in the kernel for compressing crash dumps and so on. And uh, it's already, as in the normal vendor update process in FreeBSD, we've already upgraded the version that's included in base a couple of times already. And that works very nicely. Uh, I just basically made the zfs.ko pull in the files it needs from the library. Uh, or from the, the, it compiles the bits of Z standard it needs into ZFS itself. Uh, and I've actually finished the libstand work on that as well. So you will be able to boot, even if your boot environment is compressed with Z standard. Uh, and one of the benchmarks I have a little bit later is the uh, what it looks like when you compress a uh, base install of FreeBSD with Z standard instead of LZ4, and how much of a savings you get from that. And so, like I said, uh, Z standard support is built into new syslog, our log rotator on FreeBSD now. Um, so you can compress your logs with that instead of XZIP. Uh, which can be quite a bit faster for the amount of time it takes to compress it. Although XZIP can still provide slightly better compression if you really want. But if you turn uh, Z standard up to 19, it gets really slow and will compress quite well. And like I said, it's part of the kernel now for crash dumps and so on. Uh, and we look forward to replacing GZIP and BZIP uh, for doing, dealing with compression in the loader for compressed kernels and MFS roots and RAM disks and that kind of thing. Uh, but if you have any other ideas on how you'd like to use that standard, uh, you can come talk to me or Baptiste. Uh, so the tricky part uh, with that standard was dealing with the memory uh, after I got it using the Malik interface uh, is depending on the compression level, the amount of memory you need changes. Uh, and because there are 19 levels, I really didn't want to create 19 different sized KMEM caches uh, in ZFS for dealing with it. So I basically did you know, low, medium, and high. Uh, and we'll have a little bit of waste, probably. But uh, in general, you're only going to have one context per core. Uh, so you're not going to have uh, an excessive amount of waste. So yeah, originally I did an array with one for each different compression level. Uh, but it, it got out of hand pretty quickly, because then you also have to consider the record size. So then you're multiplying 19 possible compression levels by a selection of different record sizes. Um, and <laughs> it quickly gets out of hand, especially now when we're going to add, say, 10 more negative levels to the list of supported levels. Uh, <laughs> very quickly, just doesn't make any sense. Um, but basically, we initialize the context. Uh, so in Z standard, there's a function that can actually, you give it the compression parameters you're going to use, and it estimates how much memory you're going to need. So at boot, we come up with those estimates and make uh, KMEM caches of those sizes. Um, so the decompression context uh, for any level is 152 kilobytes. And so we create a KMEM cache of that size. And then we support the uh, 16, 128, uh, 1024, and I should say 16 meg record sizes. Uh, if you use a different record size, it'll still work. It'll just round up to the next highest one. Uh, and so for the minimum level of compression, uh, that's supported today on a 16K block is going to use up to 136K of RAM for each compression thread, of which there could be one per um, thread in your, of your CPU. Um, whereas um, with the maximum compression level of 19, with the maximum block size, you could use up to 15, uh, 50 megabytes. Uh, there's, I've been talking to Jan Collette about uh, tuning we can do in the algorithm to maybe get that number down a little bit since we know the, the block size is never going to be more than exactly 16 megabytes, because that's the maximum supported by uh, ZFS. Uh, but then I ran into the uh, interesting problem of how to actually deal with the fact that there's so many levels compared to you know, LZ4. Actually, does have levels, but the LZ4 in ZFS is, is specifically set to, the, I think, the default compression level. Uh, I don't know if there's value in adding uh, the additional levels of LZ4 uh, into ZFS, uh, especially when Z standard seems to provide 
uh, a wider range of levels at, at higher speeds, and the negative levels can approach uh, the performance of LZ4 as well. Anyway, uh, the problem is the uh, way on disk that we store uh, the compression level is a little enum, a, a bit field, and so there's only 63 possible compression levels that the on-disk format can support, and we'd really like to not change that. So using up 25 or 30 of them uh, for Z standard seems kind of selfish. Uh, and you know we've already used up 13 or 15 of them uh, with the nine levels of gzip, and then we have you know RLE, uh, LZGB, LZ4, and a couple of special ones. Uh, so instead, I decided what to do. Or well, actually, I asked at the uh, FreeBSD or the Open ZFS Developer Summit, uh, and both uh, Robert Mustachi and uh, Sasso Kislikov both independently proposed the same solution to me, which is storing the compression level as a separate property, but in the user interface, treating it as a single property. So you'll, you'll run ZFS set compress equals Z standard dash 12, uh, but as that goes through the IOCTO boundary into the kernel, it'll actually split that out to compress equals Z standard and compress level equals 12 uh, and store those separately. Uh, and then the block pointer will only know what compression algorithm was used, but not what level. Because when you are reading the block and you're decompressing it, you don't need to know what level it is, right? When you are ungzip a file, you don't have to tell gzip whether it was compressed with dash 1 or dash 9. Uh, and so we can cheat that way. Or so we thought. <laughs> uh, so sorry, I, I just mentioned that this is uh, what it does. Basically, we set the compression type and the compression level are actually two separate properties. But uh, when you're setting it as a user or when you do ZFS get or uh, after being pointed to it by Matt, when you use ZFS channel programs, all of those ways, they, uh, it looks like one property and you don't have to think about the fact that it's separate. Uh, and that helped deal with the fact that um, if we dispose it as two separate properties to the user, they set compress equals Z standard, level equals 12, uh, and then they change the compression type to gzip, which doesn't have a level 12. And how do we deal with that? Uh, so instead, by exposing it as one parameter to the user, they can't create an invalid configuration that way. And like I said, the block pointer on disk only needs to know what function to feed it into decompress. It doesn't need to know the level, uh, or so we thought. So when Matt reviewed an early prototype of this, he quickly spotted a problem. If you ran the slightly odd configuration of compressed arc being disabled, uh, but you had an L2 arc, um, the problem was that when you when the L2 arc is paging stuff out of the arc on into the um, into L2 arc so that it can uh, be there when it falls out of the cache, uh, in some optimizations that George Wilson made four-ish years ago, I mean we don't store the checksum a second time on the SSD. Uh, it relies on the copy of the checksum that's in the block pointer and it's going to be in the arc that points to the L2 arc. Um, the problem is now we need to, com because compressed arc was disabled, the copy in the arc that we're going to write to the L2 arc is uncompressed. So its checksum isn't going to match what's in the block pointer on disk. So we need to compress it before we put it on the L2 arc, which is fine, except for now the block pointer doesn't tell us what level of compression to use. Uh, so I had to come up with a way to solve that, and basically, um, when data is stored compressed on disk, we actually use the first uh, four bytes of the data on disk to store the size, so we can sanity check when we decompress the data and know how big of a buffer to allocate to decompress the data into. Um, we use the top bits of that to also store the compression level, um, and as we read that in, we put that compression level uh, we put the compression level into the arc header uh, so that when we go to write to the L2 arc or a couple other things like that, we know what the compression level was so we can recompress the data with the same uh, compression level so that what's on the L2 arc will have the same checksum as what was on the physical disk. Because the block pointer only knows uh, the compression type and not the level. Uh, but this led into some interesting bugs that I found and a bit of yak shaving I had to do as I was working on this. Uh, the first one I ran into was a, a, a NUMA bug where kind of 
somewhat related to uh, the problem Mikey was having uh, that we talked about in the BOF yesterday, where um, it would decide that there wasn't enough free memory and it would basically cause the arc to shrink constantly. And this was making it never use the L2 arc, which making it very hard to test my changes to the L2 arc. Uh, a different version of it in, on head, but <laughs> well, mine was slightly different, but yes, uh, a similar thing that related to the NUMA changes that deleted the code that's causing you problems, <laughs> um, and it basically was complicating my life. And uh, but eventually it was fixed in head. But I if deft it out temporarily <laughs> to make my machine use the L2 arc so I could test the changes, um, and then I ran into the arc checksum is equal didn't deal with uh, the, the newer ADB logic. So instead of the data being in one contiguous buffer, it was a, a list of 4K buffers. Uh, and when it was checking if the checksum was equal, it was feeding the wrong kind of buffer into it, and it would cause a panic. Um, and I was like, oh. And it took me a while to dig up what the problem was. And then I found out uh, after two days that uh, Matt had pulled the fix in a couple, an hour before I had uh, done SVN up before working on my code. <laughs> so if I had waited an hour, I would have never run into this problem because Matt had already imported the fix from upstream. <laughs> but it cost me two days anyway. <laughs> uh, and then I found another one. And I was starting to get upset of everybody breaking stuff while I'm trying to build something. And I found this one was actually a real bug that I found and fixed upstream. Um, it turns out that not very many people use an L2ARC and disable the compressed arc. The compressed arc is such an amazing feature. Why would you turn it off? But it's a supported configuration. Um, and it turned out if you went even further and did uh, a compressed send and received it, so the incoming stream is compressed and you're receiving it on a machine with compressed arc disabled, when it writes the data into memory, it accounts for it at the compressed size. But because you don't have compressed arc, it's actually the physical size, not or the logical size, not the physical size. Um, and so when it accounts for the data, it loaned out and then got, so when it loans it out, it counts it as the compressed size. But when we return it, we say we're returning the whole size because we uncompressed it. Uh, and this would cause the counter that keeps track of how much memory we've loaned out during the send receive to go negative. And that triggers the panic. Uh, it was like a, a two-line fix, but I got that upstream and reviewed and committed and pulled back into FreeBSD so that when I receive a compressed stream uh, in my test configuration, I don't crash the box anymore. Uh, but that was an interesting one, uh, you know, a configuration that not many people are going to have where you've disabled the compressed arc uh, but also have an L2 arc and they're trying to do things. Oh, and are trying to receive a stream from a machine that is using compression. Uh, so now we get to the fun part, looking at the compression, uh, comparison of the compression levels you get with Z standard. Uh, so I started with the compression level negative eight, uh, which gives you a compression ratio of about 1.85 to one. Uh, and you see is actually uh, faster than LZ4. Uh, Although decompression isn't quite as fast, but the compression is faster. But the compression ratio is not quite as good. If you go to negative four, you get within a rounding error of the same level of compression and pretty close on the speed, although LZ4 still decompresses faster because there's less complexity. Uh, but if you go to negative three, you actually get slightly better compression than LZ4 for almost the same speed, but again, decompression isn't quite as good. And then if you do negative one, you get actually significantly better compression with only modestly less speed. And again, all these speeds are per core, although this time it's a 3.6 gigahertz processor. This is my NAS at home. Um, and so you can get, uh, you know, if you can do 400 megabytes per core and you have enough cores that that's faster than all your spindles put together, then uh, you, know, you might as well get the, you might as well be using the CPU instead of having it sit idle, right? Uh, and then, you know, we see gzip we can get 2.7 to 1 compression, but the best speed we can get, even at the lowest gzip compression level, is 83 megabytes a second. Whereas for even better compression with Z-standard, we can do almost 400 megabytes a second. And decompression is much faster than gzip. 
and we get you know Z standard two, and then once you get to the Z standard three, which is the default level, uh, whereas six is the default in GZIP, uh, we get even more compression, and now we're almost like eight x the the compression speed, and four x the decompression speed compared to GZIP. Uh, although it's GZIP on a CPU, I don't have uh, one of those Intel crypto offload cars to test that version of GZIP, but. Uh, then you have you know, the other 19 levels of Z standard where you can get up to almost four to one compression on the, the Silesia compression corpus. Although then you're getting down to single digit megabytes per second uh, for compression, but your decompression speed is still eight or 900 megabytes per second per core. Uh, and so you know, that probably works for you um, depending on what level, and you get to pick any of these levels of compression varying from, you know, almost a gigabyte a second down to a megabyte a second. Whatever works best for you and depend, you know, each data set can use a different one depending on the workload. Uh, so to make this a little more understandable, I made this an understandable graph. <laughs> uh, so this uh, yellow dotted line here is the, uh, sorry, the dotted lines are on this scale, which is the compression ratio going from 1x to 4x. And the, this side is the megabytes per second uh, on a log scale going from one megabyte a second to 10 gigabytes a second. Uh, so the yellow line here is the compression ratio with Z standard, uh, whereas this yellow line is what you get with LZ4. So with Z standard, you can get a compression ratio of you know, just basically 1.001 to 1 if you use negative 1,000 as your compression level. Uh, and as you turn it up, you can get higher and higher up till, uh, you know, at plus 19, where you're getting 4x compression. But the compression speed falls from 8 gigabytes a second at negative 1,000 down to, you know, 1 megabyte a second uh, at plus 19. But the decompression speed, you can see, after you get out of the negative levels, stabilizes around the 1 gigabyte per second mark. Uh, so no matter how slow your compression is, your decompression is still going to be a gigabyte per second per core. Uh, so, you know, if you write once and read many times, it might be worth doing the higher compression uh, because you're going to save that much RAM when you're caching it as well and have that much higher of a cache hit ratio. Uh, so the blue dotted line is the compression and the red dotted line is the decompression of LZ4. So you can kind of use that as a reference and decide, you know, if we choose this spot here, anything above here, then the compression speed of Z standard is faster than LZ4. Or any point above this spot in the yellow line in the compression of Z standard is better than that of LZ4. Uh, so now to give some real world examples, uh, last fall at EuroBSDCon, uh, one of the booths in the, in the front area there at the, the venue in Paris was a payment processing company and they use FreeBSD to run their database servers because uh, they wanted ZFS with Trim. And uh, their database server is all SSDs. But their database is very large, 25 terabytes, and that's all SSDs. So you know, they depend on the compression provided by LZ4 uh, in ZFS to be able to store that data on few enough SSDs that they can afford to buy enough SSDs. Uh, so they do something interesting of actually using the 128K record size uh, for their database on purpose. Part of the advantage for them is because they're basic, it's a financial transaction log, it's append only, they never modify old records. They don't get the same level of write amplification you would with a regular uh, you know, interactive database. Uh, but by using the larger record size, they get higher compression levels uh, out of LZ4 because they're giving it more data to compress at once. And the savings for them uh, by getting the higher compression and needing to buy fewer SSDs is worth it. So my immediate thought was, A, what about even bigger record sizes? And B, what about even better compression? Uh, so I tried doing uh, a similar database that we have at my day job. We have this uh, 46 gigabyte database of uh, tickets for our pay-per-view system. Uh, and I tried it with uh, 16K, 128K, and one megabyte uh, ZFS record size. Uh, and we see with LZ4, we compress the 46 gigabytes down to 19.3 gigs, which is about a 2.23 to 1. And it 
does, writes it out at about 60 uh, megabytes a second. Whereas when we use 128K, the data goes to under 10 gigs, and we get 4.5 to 1 compression. Uh, and instead of taking 12 minutes to write it out, it only takes 5 minutes because we're doing 145 uh, megabytes per second. And when we go to 1 meg, we get even better compression. But when we start using Z standard, we see compared to LZ4, we're getting a lot better compression. And then larger block size is even more compression. We go from 3x to 7x to 11x. Uh, and then if we use the uh, default compression level, so if you just set compress equals Z standard, it defaults to level 3, we get even better compression, uh, but almost the same rate. Uh, and it turns out that's probably your best trade off. But you can choose to do even higher. You know, if you're writing this data once because it's a log, uh, you only pay the compression speed penalty once, and the decompression speed is the same whether you use, you know, level 3 or level 10. Uh, so if you can afford it, you might as well use level 10. Uh, and we see that here we can get up to 12 and a half to 1. So now this 60 gigabyte database in RAM is only going to take 4 gigabytes of your RAM to have 100% cache hit ratio. <laughs> Although uh, at a write speed of 8 megabytes a second, that's probably too slow. Uh, but if you can deal with hundreds of megabytes a second, 11, you know, that's still only 4 and a bit gigs of RAM for your 45 gigabyte database with 100% cache hit ratio. Yes. Uh, if you have really slow disk, it's very useful uh, because writing less data means the, the logical write speed you're actually getting is the before the compressed size, and you're writing the or sorry, the the speed you get is the uncompressed size, but the throughput required of your disk is the compressed size. Um, and so, for small writes, the compression can actually improve your latency, which is very counterintuitive. Normally, you think uh, if I'm going to spend time compressing it, it's going to end up taking longer for each write. But if I'm writing that much less data, it might actually improve the latency. Yeah, the first bit might take a little bit longer, but the last one sure won't. Yeah. Uh, so then, if you remember the dictionary compression, the special thing at the beginning uh, that was designed to compress JSON messages, this led to the question from Matt, you know, could we use this to, say, compress the array of uh, block pointers or the indirect blocks, right? If you remember from the presentation yesterday from Sarah, you get that indirect block that has like a thousand block pointers in it. If we could, all of those have the same structure. So if we could use the dictionary to compress those, we could make those blocks smaller uh, and maybe get quite a bit of advantage, not just on the saving a little bit of storage space, but especially when the metadata is in RAM. Uh, if we can cache that much more, that many more indirect blocks in RAM, the general performance of ZFS would be better. Um, and the other question, uh, idea I had is uh, possibly training Z standard, uh, having an API that actually deals with ABD directly, so we don't have to linearize the buffer before we pass it to the compressor or the decompressor. Uh, so ABD is arc buff data. It's the scatter gather list of 4K pages instead of using a contiguous uh, pointer. Um, the other interesting uh, feature that uh, Z standard has grown upstream as in their little contrib directory uh, is adaptive compression. Uh, so before we had compress, send, receive, a very common thing to do was do a ZFS send and pipe that into gzip or xzip or pigzip or whatever. Um, so you could use Z standard for that. And then pipe that into SSH and then unzip it on the other end and then pipe it into ZFS receive. Uh, the problem was always picking the compression level. You know, even if you use xzip uh, and use multiple threads, but even at dash one, you only get like 20 megabytes per second per core because xzip is really slow, but higher compression. Uh, so Z standard grew this uh, concept of adaptive compression where it actually looks at the outside of the pipe. And if there's no data uh, buffered waiting to be written, then it starts lowering the compression level to feed data out faster. So if your network is, is absorbing all the data that your compressor is putting out, it starts turning the compression level down to keep the network busy. But if data is piling up because the network can't send it fast enough, it will start increasing the compression level. Um, so the idea is never be blocking on the compressor. Always be blocking on the output of the compressor. So saturate your network and get it done as fast as possible, but never you know, 
Com not compressing it enough could waste time because you end up, wait, you know, the network is this fast and we can't go any faster. Uh, so every bit more compression we get would be better. But if the network's not busy, we're spending all this time compressing where we could be done a lot sooner if we didn't compress it as much. So it raises and lowers the compression level uh, in order to, within a range that you select, um, to make sure that it gets done as fast as possible, whether that be by compressing it more so it's less data for your slow link, or compressing it less so that you're keeping the faster link you have busy and not blocking on the CPU all the time. So what if we could do this adaptively in ZFS when you're writing data? You know, when your machine's not busy and you've only written, uh, you know, a couple of megabytes of data in this transaction group, we could spend the time and compress it uh, at the maximum level. But when we're writing a lot of data and suddenly the compression is slowing us down and we're not keeping the disks busy and the amount of data waiting to be written is piling up, then we lower the compression level so that we get the data written out and, and we don't block applications. Uh, so this way, when the system's not busy, we compress stuff better, but if that's going to bottleneck the system, then we lower the compression level to try to get the data through fast enough. Basically, modulating the compression level based on how much dirty data is waiting to be written out and how fast we're draining that. And then the other feature that could be combined with is Nexenta has this uh, feature called Smart Compress, where it learns about individual files. So, you know, if you have this big file and you're writing to it again, and the last 100 times you've written to this file, the data has not been compressible, the chances that the next 100 are compressible is pretty low. So if a file consistently doesn't compress well, um, it will stop trying to compress and just reattempt one block every so often to see if suddenly the file has changed uh, how, what the content is like. But it means you can smartly not try to compress a video file. You know, if this file's been all video, it's probably going to continue to be all video and isn't going to be compressed. So trying one block instead of every block, or one block every so often instead of every block, means we waste less time, and that becomes more and more important as we use more expensive compression ratios, or compression algorithms. Uh, but uh, my future work, I, I really like this idea of the adaptive compression, uh, where if the system's not busy, you might as well compress it better, but if it is, I don't want to hold things up. Uh, and so I talked a little bit about the uh, Z standard APIs and what we might want to do with that. Uh, the other question I had, uh, especially for people that are using ZFS, is the negative compression levels. What would we like that to look like when you're setting the compression level? So right now, by default, or the way it works, uh, when you want to set gzip, you set compress equals gzip-9. Uh, because the flag, when you specify it on the command line, is gzip space dash 9. Um, but for Z standard, we're going to have level 1 and level negative 1. <laughs> Although on the command line, they call it Z standard dash dash fast equals 1 for negative 1. So the question is, do we make it compress equals Z standard plus 1 for the positive levels and negative 1 for the negative levels, or Z standard dash 1 for, negative, or for the positive and Z standard fast dash 1 for the negative level? Or? or? <laughs> I think the latter probably makes sense. Like, Z standard fast dash one and Z yes. standard dash one. Uh, that, I, I agree that probably makes the most sense. Although it's slightly counterintuitive when all of a sudden Z standard fast dash one is slower than Z standard fast dash nine. Yeah. But that's, that, that's mostly a documentation thing, I suppose. But. Hey, I guess the question is like, do we want it to work like Z standard? Because that's, I mean, that's how they yeah. tend to do it, right? Yeah. Or Right, because uh, in particular, the negative levels, there's no bound. You can, you can ask for negative a million, uh, although the difference between negative a million and negative 10,000 is pretty small. Um, so I was thinking of just picking eight or 10 negative levels that make sense and, and including those. Well, it's ZFS, so it's all really big numbers, so it'd be like 18 quadrillion or whatever it is. <laughs> uh, other questions? 
this like a slash two for some project and uh, someone has revived that now and they're doing the adaptive compression kind of like what you said but based on the Q depth, uh -huh. uh, the IO Q depth. So you might want to take a look at that. Okay, because I got, I still, uh, George gave me some code to look at the amount of dirty data, but the Q depth maybe makes more sense as well. I'm not sure exactly. Or both or something. Yeah, I think the Q depth might be a little bit more precise in the measurement. Yeah. Uh, so, Z standard. Luckily for us, Z standard was relicensed under a pure BSD license or uh, a dual BSD GPL without the patent nonsense in version 1.3. And, and, and so your work started after that or before that? Uh, before that, but we're not. We didn't modify Z standard at all. So we just switched to the new one that's BSD license. Cool. So yay, so no patent plus. Nope. Wasn't on issue in this particular problem. Yes. Uh, before it was ready to be committed, it was already licensed uh, in something more acceptable. David? Just, just for documentation for your uh, crossover graph of compression versus frequency. Yep. There's one window where LZ4 has a better compression, but the compression rate is still higher while the input rate hasn't gotten worse yet. Mm hmm. Yeah, zoom in on that, the middle section a bit, yeah. Robbie? Yeah, um, that was that was partly why I was looking at the the, the George's right throttle work as the inspiration for the adaptive compression because the idea is to um, decide when to delay uh, the writers to, to put back pressure and basically when we get to the point where we're going to start putting back pressure on, we actually lower the compression uh, to try to avoid actually exhibiting uh, pushing back pressure to the application. Yes, uh, so LZ4 does always have faster decompression, but with the compression ratio being less, if your working set is bigger than the amount of RAM you have, the higher compression ratio means you have more of it stored in RAM and you don't have to do it go to the disk. Uh, so it, it really depends on your workload whether better compression is useful to you. But you know, if your database is terabytes and you only have gigabytes of RAM, uh, if, you, if you can compress it all and fit it all in RAM, that's always going to be better than having to go to the disk ever. Uh, but if that works with LZ4, like the original design of a compressed arc, then that's great. But if a higher cache hit ratio is going to help you, then maybe you make the trade-off um, of the, the compression speed. But you know, if your machine has 32 cores and you can decompress a total 32 gigabytes per second, maybe it doesn't matter that you could do 64 gigabytes per second if you used LZ4. Uh, it depends. Can I just kind of tangentially connect it? How much CPU usage are you seeing off of your machines when you're actually serving data? Or how much free CPU usage are you seeing to fill up with extra compression? Because, you know, at some scale, it tends to be that, you know, run out of CPU. And I'm just kind of curious. I mean, are you seeing a whole lot of... My CPUs are almost always idle. Okay. They're not doing much at all. Uh, there's, this work isn't that applicable for scale engine's main thing of serving video because that doesn't compress. Uh, so we won't use this for that. Uh, but on our database servers, we found this to be uh, extremely useful. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, but yeah, on our big file servers, the CPU is like, there's almost, the only reason we have a machine that has 32 CPU threads is so that we could put more RAM in it. <laughs> Caller? I am not going to write block point or rewrite. I'll leave that up to Matt. <laughs> uh, but you could do ZFS send and receive it where you've set the property and cause it to recompress in the background. But doing it in place, uh, as Matt's been known to say, is like trying to change your pants while running. But ZFS remap only writes, rewrites the block pointers and the indirect blocks, not the data blocks, right? Yeah. Matt, would, would remap let us recompress or not? I don't think so, but well, could it? You could extend it to do that, but you would break all the block chains with snapshots. Ah. Maybe it's worth it. I don't know. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.